Um, since we are coming from different regions across uh, North America, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement. So we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Of course, uh, please check out native-land.ca to find out more about the region that you are in. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Jenny McCune, uh, who is an assistant professor in the biological sciences department at the University of Lethbridge. So she grew up actually in uh, Orangeville, and she did her Bachelor of Science at the University of Guelph, Guelph and then uh, worked at a, as a field assistant in the Florida Keys and Oregon. Um, did her Master's of Science in uh, England at the University of Kent in Ethnobotany, and then worked uh, as a biologist in California for a couple of years with the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland, um, and completing her PhD at UBC, studying long-term plant community changes in Southern Vancouver Island. Um, she started at Lethbridge in 2019 after a couple of postdocs in uh, Southern Ontario. So uh, today she's joining us to talk about rare plants in Southern Ontario's woodlands. Where are they from? What limits them? And who pollinates them? I'd like to welcome you and I'll, uh, I'll send it over to you now, Jenny. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so I will share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, perfect. Uh, so thanks very much for having me today. Uh, I am speaking to you from the University of Lethbridge, which is on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy. But the work I'll be talking about is all on rare plants in Southern Ontario. And so I was very uh, pleased to be invited to be a, an associate of the Center for Bee Ecology, uh, Evolution and Conservation, because as a plant ecologist, I think I have a lot to learn about pollinators and their role in, in uh, plant populations and plant conservation. And so I have shamelessly started with a picture of the endangered wood poppy with a bee on it. Uh, I believe this is a honeybee, but I'm, I, uh, can stand corrected if I'm wrong. Um, so I'll be talking a, a little tiny bit about pollinators at the very end. So I hope you'll stick around for that. Um, but uh, you'll see that this picture is probably maybe not an accurate representation of who might be the pollinators of the wood poppy. So here at the University of Lethbridge, I teach a course, a senior course in conservation biology, and we talk a lot about Canada's Species at Risk Act which I'm very glad that we have, but I have to say my favorite part of it is probably the preamble, which states that wildlife in all its form has value in and of itself, in addition to all the other useful things that wildlife provides us, like spiritual, recreational, educational, scientific reasons. And so I really appreciate this sentiment that species have value just for their own merits. And so then, helpfully, the Species at Risk Act defines wildlife. And wildlife is much broader than perhaps many people in the general public think of it. So a wildlife species is a species, subspecies, variety, or genetically distinct population of animal, plant, or other organism. So everything except for bacteria and viruses. So I find myself um, convincing people to broaden their idea of what wildlife is. So most people probably think of wildlife as something like this caribou. Perhaps the folks in your group do a lot of work explaining to people that also things like bumblebees are wildlife. And I like to emphasize that this little spotted wintergreen plant here also is wildlife. It's wild and it's alive. 
And so the talk that I'm going to give you today is just kind of an overview about some of the work I've been doing on rare plant ecology and conservation in southern Ontario since about 2014. So I'm going to start with basically the questions that we're asking are some of the most basic questions you can ask. So rare plants, where are they and what limits them? Then I'll talk a little bit about um, some work. We're just getting started doing experimental translocations, which kind of can, can accomplish two goals, testing ecological theory about what limits these species, but also hopefully improving and aiming for actual recovery of some of the rarest plants in Southern Ontario. Then I'll talk about um, a collaboration I've had with some colleagues here and back in Ontario testing genetic differentiation of one of our rarest plant species. And then I'll end up with uh, a, just a very pilot study that we uh, started last summer looking at um, insect visitors to one of our rarest plants. So first of all, where are they? Well, it's very clear that Southern Ontario is a hotspot for rare plants in Canada. This is from an older uh, rare plant database um, from 1994. And I'm actually not sure how precisely a rare plant was defined, but you can see that there's really a hot spot where you are in Southern Ontario. Here is a more recent map. So this is for all species at risk in Canada, looking at the overlaps of their ranges. And you can see again, even if you're including everything else other than plants, Southern Ontario is real hot spot. There's a couple reasons for this. For one thing, we have kind of the northern tip of the Carolinian or deciduous forest zone that kind of creeps into Southern Ontario. And at the same time, this is one of the most densely populated uh, by humans area in our country. And so a lot of the landscape, as you know, looks like this. So prior to European settlement, um, Southern Ontario was probably somewhere around 80% forested. Now, depending where you are, uh, which county, it ranges from about 5% forest cover to 40 or 45 in some counties. And so with so many people around and so few, relatively few natural areas of habitat left, you would think we would have a pretty good idea of where our rare plants are, are growing. But actually there's a lot of uncertainty about this. Um, so this is from the Natural Heritage Information Center kind of database. And uh, this is the broad beech fern, which is a special concern species. And so according to the records, you know, we think there's at least 40 occurrences, but probably closer to 50. Most of the populations are on private land, which means perhaps there aren't as many botanists going out and surveying them. And many records are old. So we have a lot of uncertainty about where the species is and how it's doing. Now that's a fern, which is relatively, uh, you know, perhaps blends in and, and might take some specialist knowledge to recognize, but even something as bright and sort of obvious as the wood poppy, we have uncertainty about. So this species was first collected in Ontario in, way back in 1887 at a site near London. And then no one saw it, no one collected it again for basically a century. There were some sightings of it, but no collections in the 70s. And then a population was discovered in 1987. When the status report was written in 2007, there were three known populations and the authors of the report figured, you know, this thing is so bright and beautiful it's unlikely to have been seriously overlooked. However, a fourth population was found in 2010, and then me and my field assistants found another one in 2015. So it is true that this plant is very stunning and beautiful, but really only for two to three weeks when it's flowering. The rest of the time, it can really blend in with the rest of the understory vegetation. And here's an example. So this, the arrows are pointing to four patches of blooming wood poppies. But you can imagine if you walked by at this distance, it actually would be quite easy to miss them. Um, so I'm not at all certain that we have only five 
occurrences of wood poppy. I, I trust and believe that it is quite rare, um, but we don't know for sure that that's all that we have. So then I asked myself, okay, how can we do better at finding these, these populations that no one knows about, especially on private land? How can we target places that we should be searching so that we can make our field work more efficient? And one way to do that is to use species distribution models. So uh, folks in Europe and lots of other places have used these to prioritize areas to search for rare species, not just plants, but animals too. And the basic idea is if you have records of where a species grows, you put those in. So this is a segment of the known occurrences of green dragon in Southern Ontario. So you can see we have records of it all along the Maitland River here, um, extending in from Godrich. So you feed that into the model, you feed in some geospatial data on climate and soils and underlying geology, and you get an outcome like this. So each of these tiny little orange or red squares are areas that the model predicts has suitable habitat for the green dragon. And so you can see quite clearly here that if we have all these records of green dragon on the Maitland River, it looks like we should also be looking along the Bayfield River down to the south here. So as part of my postdoc work, what I did was build a bunch of these species distribution models for about 40 species um, that grow in woodlands in Southern Ontario, and then basically go to a bunch of these sites and survey them to see if we can actually find the plant. And so I did that with basically field crews of over four years, about seven or eight undergraduates and two graduate students. And we had great adventures going around and, and knocking on doors. We mostly worked on private land and saying, can we go back into your bush back there and, and look for this plant? And most people said yes. So we really got around over four years, so four summers, between 2014 and 2018, we surveyed 282 one hectare forest sites. And it turns out if you look for rare plants, you will find them. So approximately 30 to 35% of these plots have at least one S1, S2, or S3 ranked species growing in it. So when it comes to testing whether these SDM predictions are useful, what we're hoping for is that places where we find the plant on average have higher predicted habitat suitability than places where we don't find it. So this is data from the, just the first year of our study with seven of our species. And the y-axis is the predicted habitat suitability from the SDM and the x-axis is just presence or absence. So if I put the data on, the, the bars are the means. So you can see that for most species, on average, we're seeing the pattern that we hope to see, where there is a higher average suitability in places where the plant grows. There is a lot of variation. And you can see this last species here, Phagopterus, uh, actually had a horrible model <laughs> where we actually found it, tended to find it in places that were of lower suitability on average. But you'll notice I've colored in the dots here. Some of them are filled in and some of them are open. And that has to do with what's going on on the landscape around these sites. So as you know, there's lots of agriculture in Southern Ontario and, and the forest cover is quite fragmented. So what I did is look at each site that we surveyed. So these yellow squares in the middle represent a 100 by 100 meter survey site. And the big circle around them is a 500 meter buffer. So this area is about 80 hectares. So some sites tended to have lots of forests surrounding them, more than half of the circle is filled, and others had much less than 40 hectares. So that's what the different colors in this graph mean. And so you can see that for some species, there's an interaction going on between the habitat suitability according to the model and whether or not there's more or less than 40 hectares of contiguous forest surrounding the site. 
or of total forests surrounding the site. Um, so particularly for these two species, um, if we only look at places with a large amount of forest habitat surrounding them, there's actually a stronger uh, relationship between the likelihood of finding the species and the SDM prediction. So we might look at all these sites where Aracema dracontium green dragon was absent, even though it had hot, very high predicted habitat suitability. And all of those sites tend to be in areas with very low amounts of forest surrounding them. So we have some indication that landscape context actually also matters if we, if we wanna try and predict where these species are. The other thing that we noticed or that I noticed when I started looking at where we were finding these things is that most of the time when we find a new occurrence of a rare plant, it tends to be about five kilometers or closer to a known occurrence. And so I started wondering about whether the dispersal abilities of these species could be affecting their ability to get into suitable habitat on such a fragmented landscape. So for example, maybe a species like uh, flowering dogwood on the left here, which has these bright shiny berries that are dispersed by birds, would be more able than something like on the right here, uh, Virginia bluebells, which as far as we know, their seeds just drop to the ground. They have no dispersal, a specialized dispersal mechanism. And we also have things like um, blue ash, which has uh, keys, so winged seeds that are kind of designed to fly a bit in the air. And things like ferns and orchids, which have tiny, tiny microscopic seeds that probably can quite easily blow on the wind, but we're not quite sure if they can go very far, especially if they're in a forest understory where, you know, the wind probably can't take them uh, too far away. So once we had um, good independent presence and absence data from about 24 different species that varied in their dispersal traits, we could look at, okay, how good is, is the SDM at predicting where we will find them? And is that different depending on their dispersal uh, mechanism? And it turns out that it is. So you can see that these animal dispersed species um, are really much more well predicted by the SDMs uh, than something like Virginia bluebells, which has no, uh, no specialized dispersal mechanism. So it seems like dispersal ability also, also matters. So the things we found out, SDMs are useful, not for every species. Uh, some species, about I think three out of the 40-ish that I modeled just could not produce a useful model, but they're useful for most species. They can help us get into the right habitat. And there definitely are undiscovered populations of rare plants in Southern Ontario. Now, SDMs are definitely not perfect. Uh, and a great example of this is the wood poppy. So when I tried to build a model, we only had uh, these four little dots are the four, four known occurrences, uh, which is quite a low amount to try and build an SDM with. You're usually having at least 10 occurrences is a lot better. So the predicted suitable area is the, is the gray shading here. So you can see how it's very much limited to quite a small area surrounding the city of London. Uh, but the new population that we found in 2015 is up here near Bayfield. So it's a, it's a good lesson that, especially if you have very few occurrences and they're quite geographically clustered, your SDM can be overfit and can under predict uh, what that species can actually tolerate. So we also learned that landscape context seems to matter for some species at least, and dispersible, dispersal ability may also be a factor. So when we're thinking ecologically about what limits these species, we know we don't have very many of these populations. And so there, there could be a couple of factors interacting here. First of all, it could be we're at the northern edge of the range, and maybe there just isn't a lot of the right type of habitat that these species need. So maybe they're habitat limited. On the other hand, they also could be dispersal limited. And on this fragmented landscape, they're 
not able to access everywhere that's suitable. So now that we have these SDMs that, we can, that we've tested and sort of validated with independent data, we're interested in doing the ultimate test, which is actually planting some of these plants in places that are predicted to be suitable and unsuitable and seeing if they can survive there. So for example, imagine that we have a wood poppy population here in this patch. And then we have three other patches that the model predicts are suitable, but the wood poppy is absent. So what we'd like to do to really tease apart this question is plant some seeds or plants in places that are both suitable and unsuitable and see how they do. At the same time, this could be a way to improve translocation as a recovery tool. So right now we have five occurrences. We have five populations of wood poppy in all of Canada. Only one of them is on protected land. And so wouldn't it be nice if we could establish maybe four or five additional populations on protected land? To me, this is what true recovery is. It, recovery of a species is having more than we have now and, and preferably having more in places that are well protected. So, you know, if, if a landowner stacks his firewood in the wrong place, or if there's some kind of, you know, deer browsing that basically wipes out a population, we don't have, you know, we have some insurance policy. We have some other populations where that species and its genetic diversity is safeguarded. So, assisted translocation or reintroduction is something that's mentioned a lot as a potential tool for, for recovery of rare, rare species. And Swan et al. in this paper, um, they are with the Wilder Institute at the Calgary Zoo, kind of the conservation arm of the zoo. And they looked through all the recovery documents for Canada's species at risk. And they looked for where reintroduction or translocation was mentioned as a potential recovery option. And you'll notice, so the green here is where species that had translocation recommended or potential. And you can see 107. So the majority of the plants had this at least mentioned as an option. Then they looked at, okay, how many species was this actually done? Or can we find evidence in the recovery documents that there's been some research into this option? And here you can see that plants fall near the bottom. So there were only 16 where they could see that translocation has actually been tried. Why is this? Well, I agree with, um, so this is an article by David Clements in 2013, who talks about the climate of caution in Canada regarding plant translocation in particular. So we ecologists are thinking a lot about how climate is warming, ranges are gonna to have to shift. Many of these species are not wind dispersed or animal dispersed, so they're quite dispersal limited. So we may have to consider this as a tool for us to help them survive. And yet the climate of caution makes it unlikely that, that this is gonna happen. So this is 2013. I would say there's still this climate of caution in Canada. And I have a sort of two theories for why this is. The, the first is that plant translocations are quite hard. So many landowners that I talk to and I tell them about these rare plants and, and a lot of them will say, well, can't you just plant some? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an obvious thing to try and do. And the answer is yes, you can. And in places like um, particularly the United States and Australia, there have been hundreds of experimental translocations of, of rare and endangered plants. Um, but the truth is that many of them fail. So it is hard to do. And particularly because we're sometimes not very good at predicting what good habitat really is. So that's where I hope these species distribution models could help us. The second reason for a climate of caution is that people are really worried that if translocation can be done successfully, it can be used as an, as an excuse 
that, okay, well, if you want to put your new gravel pit here where there's the population of wood poppy, that's fine because we'll just establish a new one somewhere else. And that is definitely not my goal. So uh, I think we should use translocation to increase the number of populations, but we definitely still have to conserve and protect the extant natural populations that we know about. So I'm hoping to maybe change this, this climate of caution a little bit. And so I've got a, a collaboration going with um, Ryan Norris at the University of Guelph, who is working currently on a butterfly reintroduction in Southern Ontario. Uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, who are crucial because of course they own a lot of protected land that has suitable habitat for these plants in Southern Ontario. The Wild Art Institute, who I already mentioned, who are, are really experts on animal translocations globally. And Guyana Say, who are a, a First Nations run native plant nursery and restoration firm uh, down near Brantford on the Six Nations. So we are planning a translocation trial to start this summer. So the middle person here is Emma Nigel, my PhD student who will be leading this, our undergrad Kirsty, and Nina Hunt, who is a horticultural research technician working with us and Diana Say, so that we can grow the plants there in Southern Ontario and not try and grow them here in Alberta and drag them across the country. So what we're planning to do is using SDMs and testing them out as a way to direct uh, rare plant translocations and choose the right habitat. So we're going to work with two species, the wood poppy at the top here, which is dispersed by ants, so presumably is quite dispersal limited, and crooked stem aster, which is a wind dispersed aster. So the general idea is within NCC properties to choose sites of high, medium, and low suitability according to our species distribution models, and then to, to plant at sites within those, uh, both seeds and plants, in varying sort of microhabitats, so that we can tease apart, okay, what matters more? Is it the broad suitability at the one hectare kind of scale, or does it matter more the conditions at these, within these plots? So, you know, maybe it's a bit moister down here at one corner, maybe those microclimate conditions actually matter more. So that's what we're getting going this summer. Okay, genetics. I'm not a population geneticist, but thinking about the situation that these plants find themselves in has got me curious about population genetics. So if we're thinking about plants that are now living in a landscape like this, how distinct are plant populations living in these fragments genetically? Are they becoming inbred or are they getting gene flow somehow between populations? And also we wonder about the Canadian populations of these plants, which are often at the Northern edge of their range. So the light green here is the Eastern deciduous forest zone. You can see how it just peaks into Southern Ontario. So many of these rare plants that I study actually, for example, the wood poppy, is doing quite fine in Kentucky, but it could be that our populations are genetically distinct and that might become important if and when the whole distribution of these species has to start shifting north to kind of track climatic conditions. So we have some inkling that for the wood poppy, Canadian populations might be different. And that's because we did a little common garden trial here in our greenhouses at the University of Lethbridge. Um, so this is Jackson, one of my undergraduate students. And we got a handful of seeds from a couple of the Ontario populations of the wood poppy. And then we ordered some in. So you can just buy them online from uh, native plant, native seed companies. And we just grew them in pots in the greenhouse and tracked their growth. And we saw some differences. So first of all, um, the red lines here are the two Canadian populations. And these plants actually grew, had a, had a quicker growth rate than the mail order seeds did. 
and they produced more leaves. So there was a significant difference between the, the seeds sourced from the Ontario populations and seeds sourced from mail orders, presumably which is from US, United States plants. We also noticed some just uh, morphological differences. So this is a, a zoomed in uh, leaf picture at the top. So this is the underside of a leaf. And on the left are, is the mail order leaf. And on the right is a Canadian leaf. So you can tell that there's way more trichomes, these leaves of, of the mail order, presumably United States origin are lots fuzzier than the Ontario plants. And the seeds also look a bit different. So the Canadian seeds tend to be darker and rounder, while the mail order seeds were more elongated and kind of lighter brown. So we wanted to look into the genetics. And, and this, the, gen, the population genetics of wood poppy is a longstanding question. It's been written into sort of the main goals of the recovery strategies since they were written. So here you can see in blue the kind of estimated North American well, global range of the wood poppy. And in the red dots here in the main part of the range in um, the United States are samples that were collected back in the early 2000s by Dr. Jane Bowles, who was really um, the early wood poppy expert. She was the author of the status report and the recovery strategies and was really kind of uh, a mover that, that got a lot of research done on the wood poppy. So she and Dr. David Galbraith, who is um, with the Royal Botanical Gardens, drove all around here <laughs> in the US getting sam tissue samples of wood poppies. Um, they started analyzing them at Trent University with Dr. Brad White's lab. And they did a few things with microsats, but then funding ran out and a technician left and they just never finalized this work. Luckily, they saved the samples. I got samples in 2019 from all five of the known Ontario populations and also from the Royal Botanical Gardens here uh, in Hamilton, which has an ex situ population that um, was sourced from the London population here just south of London. So luckily we were able to get these US store, uh, samples that have been in storage for 20 years basically from the Natural Resources DNA Profiling Center at Trent University. And then I got um, my colleague here, Dr. Teresa Berg and um, some of her former students and postdocs, Dr. Brendan Graham and Dr. Linda Lay who are population ecologists to extract the DNA, send it out for sequencing and then look at the results. So I'm gonna show you some preliminary results from this work. So here's a structure plot. Um, those of you who work in genetics are probably used to looking at these things. Uh, so this is based on about 10,000 uh, SNPs. And basically, as I understand this, you know, we're asking the program to divide these populations into two, three, four, five, six, or seven groups based on their DNA sequences. And as you can see, no matter how many groups you ask to divide these populations into, the Canadian populations are, are coming out as a distinct group. The USA populations are here on the right. And interestingly, these ones that are not highlighted in the middle here, um, those are the, the uh, mail order populations. Um, so we bought these from uh, commercial seed companies. So if you look at this at a, in a ordination, so in this ordination, populations that are close together have very similar genetics. And if they're far apart, they're quite different in terms of those 10,000 SNPs. And you can see that Canada, the Canadian populations really do kind of segregate out on their own. Then there's a main clump of the, the USA populations and the mail order ones, again, sort of are a bit off on their own. And then if we zoom into only the Canadian populations, we also see some differentiation here. 
And so what we're hoping to work on more is to see whether we can uh, link the degree of differentiation with potentially things like um, geographic distance. So here at the top right, you can see RBG, which is covering up the London population. They're, they're identical, which we would expect because the RBG population was sourced from the London population. In the bottom right here, DN, DENF and ID, I'm not surprised that they're similar because they're the two closest populations. They're about they're only about three kilometers apart. And the Bay population here on the left is the new population that we found in 2015. So it's about 50 kilometers or so away from the nearest known occurrence. So we do have evidence that the Canadian populations not only are distinct from the United States one, ones, but they have some uh, differentiation between them. So there's more work to do. Um, I hope we can figure out things like levels of inbreeding and, and uh, questions like that. Okay, so to finish up, I wanna talk about the things that um, this group is really interested in, which is of course pollinators. And um, here is a recent paper by some of your members, including Dr. Kala about how little we know about plant pollinator interactions for species at risk in Ontario. So this study looked at 53 plant species, uh, plant species at risk that are insect pollinated and what information is out there about the pollinators. And it turns out a lot of them have visitors, so insect visitors identified to order or superfamily, but quite few of them have them identified to genus. And most importantly, only three of them had some kind of survey about pollinators completed in Ontario. Um, so my undergraduate student, Kirsty, who you saw a picture of before, became really interested in this. And we decided to do just a very basic preliminary insect visitor study for the spotted wintergreen, which is an endangered plant in Southern Ontario. So what we know about the pollinators of spotted wintergreen is basically based on one study from 1988 in the United States. So, so we know from that, that it's likely pollinated mainly by bumblebees, but we have no idea how recent widespread declines in bumblebee species could be affecting this plant. So Kirsty set up a little just four day pollinator observation study where she you know, defined clumps of flowering plants and she just sat for 20 minutes at each clump and documented what was visiting them, mostly with photos. So the study from Massachusetts found that the main pollinators were males and workers of Bombus perplexus and then occasionally Bombus bimaculatus and, and vegans and rarely some visits from honeybees. What Kirsty found is that, of course, there were plenty of insect visitors that were not <laughs> pollinators, probably, like ants and flies and various things. Um, but yes, it seemed like the main things that were um, visiting the flowers in a way that suggests they were um, collecting pollen or nectar were bumblebees. And I, we have not analyzed all of this data that she collected yet. She has millions of photos to go through, but um, maybe some of you here that are used to looking at kind of fuzzy bee photos would take a guess at whether that bumblebee is one of the ones that was the main pollinators um, in Massachusetts. So I think there's a lot of scope and, and that's why I'm so excited to get to know some of the members of this, this group. I think there's a lot of scope for collaboration and be figuring out more, you know, how are the, how is pollination proceeding with some of these rare plants? Um, and, and even just the very basics of who is doing the pollination. Even the wood poppy, which is so beautiful and, and uh, you know, you would think we would know something about this, um, but the, the recovery strategies basically just say, well, it, 
the flowers appear to be constructed for insect pollination, um, but visits by insects are not common, commonly observed and plants are capable of self-pollination. Um, so this is a case where we really don't have a clue. Um, so the photo on the right was taken by me at one of the native populations because this insect happened to land there and I took its picture. Um, so I don't know what this insect is or whether it might be a pollinator or not. The picture on the right, which I started out with at the start of my talk, is probably not the best indication because this is a nursery sourced plant growing on my back deck here in Lethbridge. Um, so probably not the best evidence to conclude that honeybees are a, a major pollinator of wood poppies. Uh, so this is a mystery as far as I know. So that's all I have. Thanks again for having me. Uh, I always like to thank all the students and collaborators that really have been a part of this work and especially the landowners. Um, so all those 282 sites, um, not all of them are private land, but that represents somewhere between 100 and 150 landowners who said, yes, you can go and look for rare plants on my property. So I really appreciate them. So thanks very much and I look forward to your questions.